Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Chris, I would like to thank the European Association of Geochemistry uh, to invite me to um, this lecture tour. And thank you very much for, for hosting me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about my research. Um, my educational background, so I've done my bachelor's and master's in Germany at the Karl Mosiecki Universität in, in Oldenburg, then went on to do a PhD at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, moved on to do a two-year postdoc at the LMTG in Toulouse, um, and from there moved on to the University of Bristol, did a postdoc, and then had an assistant professor position. Um, and then in 2017, moved to the University of Libre University. Uh, that would be um, so, as already mentioned, my research focuses largely on carbon cycle and climate effects. Um, but before I go into detail about this, the AG has asked me to provide some additional information. Um, Um, there's a lot of support available for early career scientists from the EAG, namely sponsorship programs, a really good early career science ambassador program. Um, there's a really nice uh, job portal on the EAG website. You can find a lot of information about all of this here on the website or by contacting the office. So um, if you're motivated to do that. Uh, there's also a community journal, Geochemical Perspectives Letters. It's open access and has no page charges, so it's going to be for free. As short article, few thousand words, and generally of high quality. So take that into consideration. And now to the carbon cycle climate effects. So in the first lecture, I want to talk a little bit about past climates and past climate events. Uh, namely, oceanic and oxic events, that's in the Cretaceous, when the Earth looked a little bit more like this. Um, and specifically focusing on the conditions that led to the start of the termination of these carbon cycle climate perturbations in the Cretaceous, and how we, through a very um, multi step integrated model data approach, got to learn a little bit more about how the Earth system responded to this condition. So when we look at Earth's climate history, we can see it's, it's kind of, we can see this sequence of uh, warm and cold periods uh, that just follow each other, uh, sometimes a little bit more extreme than others. Um, and a, a big interest in all of this is like, how did the climate system respond to these perturbations? Um, what were the triggers of these perturbations and the time scales of these perturbations? And it's, this is particularly relevant nowadays uh, because we are we're facing like a very rapid perturbation of the climate system caused by anthropogenic activity. And looking at these past periods really can help us understand how the Earth system can react, how the carbon cycle can react and did react in the past to these often much more extreme, even though on slower timescales, um, carbon cycle perturbations time, and how did the Earth system recover from these extreme events? How can we find this out? Well, luckily, the Earth system is writing its own history book. Here you can see these are uh, sediment cores that have been collected or drilled all over the world. Uh, they are stored in a a core repository. There are multiple around the world. So um, these ones specifically, they come from the ocean drilling program. So it's like a deep sea drilling program that can recover sediment cores of considerable length, uh, often up to kilometers um, down in really deep water depths, so out in the deep ocean. Um, that's a history book of the Earth. So it's, it's been recorded in the sediments. And then once the sediments get uh, uplifted, obviously in the rock record as well. Um, but I will focus most on the Mesozoic climate, which is recorded in the sediments. And this history book records like the stories of extreme mass extinctions, extreme events, um, and extreme classiations in Earth's history. This is obviously not recorded in the Paleozoic sedimentary records, but in the rough record, this is the Neoproterozoic snowball Earth. 
Um, and really, really different ocean environments from when we are now and oceans that were uh, highly sulfidic and oxidic. Um, so you would say, well, that's great. So the Earth system is recording its own history. So we should know quite a lot about it um, since we have access to, to rocks and sediments on Earth. And the thing is, like, um, the seafloor for a really, really long time was considered as a, as a desert, a pretty sterile environment, not much going on, um, pretty boring. So nobody was really interested. And then uh, interest kind of started only in the middle of the 19th century with a big hypothesis that we formulated about past ice ages, um, past uh, climate possibilities of past climate change, the theory of evolution and things like that. Um, and the, the first marine expedition was a MHS Challenger expedition that was the end of the 19th century. And they recovered uh, a few hundred trash samples or sediment samples, but not much done with this. So even at the end of the Second World War in 1942, Still, the three quarters of the Earth's surface that are covered by oceans, that are covered by water, were virtually unknown. So we, didn't, we didn't really know what was there. We didn't really know um, all of the, the, the kind of Earth secrets and Earth history that was recorded in the studies. And that drastically changed with the beginning of the deep sea drilling program in the 60s. Uh, that's also where like, the Ice Age theory was then confirmed or developed. Um, they recovered almost 100,000 meters of uh, sediment cores and stored these cores, so providing a lot of information about past climates, past environments, uh, and there was climate history. This was followed by the ocean drilling program running from the 80s to 2004, it's a joint resolution, uh, recovering a further 200 or more than 200,000 meters of sediment records. Um, followed by the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, which ran until 2013, um, covering even more deep sea sediments. By then, we already developed uh, quite a good understanding of a lot of the past events, um, especially through the analysis of these uh, sediment cores. And then, since 2013, the International Ocean Discovery Program. So the point is that these deep sea drilling activities really provided us with a lot of information about past climates. And as um, Charles Hutton said, like the present is the key to the past. We can also see that this these past information about these past climates also the key to the future to understand how the carbon cycle can respond to these extreme conditions. So sometimes. Uh, you can already clearly see, so you might wonder why all these people are taking uh, photos with seven cores. Uh, uh, but you can see here is a very clear uh, difference. This is a Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And here you can see the PTM, um, which is basically a, a, a marine uh, or ocean acidification event. So you can see like the disappearance of calcareous. Sediments, uh, limestone sediments, uh, and uh, completely limestone free world. And this is recorded in different locations around the globe as well. So sometimes these changes are very obvious in the sedimentary record. You can visually see that. Um, very often, that's not necessarily the case. Um, this, this history book is a little bit difficult to read. Um, as you can see, if you have material that settles down into the sediment, um, it's not just sitting into the sediment, uh, and contrary to the, the past view that the seafloor is a sterile desert where nothing happens, there's actually it's a biogeochemical reactor, there are early diagenetic processes that kind of degrade organic material, consume terminal electronic samples, release metabolites, precipitate altogenic minerals, they kind of alter the sedimentary record. So this primary signal we are recording is, is altered and that makes sometimes very, very different. So you can see it's something like that. So I have a record here that's deposited and then with the action of diagenetic processes in these upper, in this upper sediment um, area or, or deeper even later, um, 
you, you will have like a consumption of this signal here, for instance, I put some um, organic uh, material rich layer uh, with some mineral inside, and then the reprecipitation of these minerals that is also down here, or even new precipitation of altogenic minerals in a completely different location. So that makes it really, really difficult at times. So the Earth History book is pretty difficult to read. It's it's not only difficult to reach, um, so you have to have a, a ship, a research vessel that can drill deep into the sediment, because the deeper we drill into the sediment, the further we go back in time. Um, it's often incomplete, like the rock record as well. There are things missing. Maybe there was no sedimentation. Uh, maybe something was eroded. Um, maybe something just was consumed and disappeared over these times. And the thing that makes it really, really difficult is that things have been added later. Um, so there has been, have been processes in the sediment that have acted over these long time scales uh, during which this material was buried and had overwritten or written new things into this history. So that makes it very, very difficult to go back and say like, well, this is how the environment looked, let's say 100 million years ago. Um, and this is the original signal. And this is what was deposited at this time at this place. So pretty difficult, but um, difficult is not necessarily bad. Uh, difficulties, or you should see difficulties always as opportunities. So there are things that make it very difficult, but these things that make it difficult might also contain very, very useful information. And today in this talk, I will show you how we use that uh, in a combination with like observations so from this drilling, from these sediment records, and specifically through extracting pool waters from these sediments, analyzing uh, the solid phase sediment and combine that with numerical modeling um, to really unveil some of the secrets that were uh, recorded in these sediment cores. And I want to take you back to the late Cretaceous. So that's about 100 million years ago. Uh, that's about the, the end of the era of the dinosaurs. So there's a big impact when uh, the dinosaurs disappeared just around this time. And the Cretaceous is a specifically interesting period in, in the uh, geological past because it's, it's really spiked by uh, a lot of these um, oceanic and oxic events, OAEs. Uh, they call them. So they were discovered a long time ago, but formerly like uh, uh, Schlang and Jenkins, uh, they coined the term. Um, they occur in different at different times of Earth's history as well. So you can see here, for instance, PTM was sometimes um, propagated as OAE as well. There have been other events, the Ebonian as well, the Calabasa event, for instance. But the Cretaceous is specifically prominent because it has a series of events. And at least these events here highlighted in, in orange are uh, uh, confirmed to be global events. So clo global events, global extreme carbon cycle, climate perturbation that affected um, the whole Earth and all geochemical records. And first, they were kind of identified by black shales, so Cretaceous black shales. So we, you can see that here. It's a little bit like with a PTM. It's a specific layer you find every time you drill somewhere and you find Cretaceous sediments. Uh, it's an organic uh, matter rich layer. They can have organic matter contents of 1 to 30 weight percent, so quite enriched. Um, especially here in the deep chilling sites in the Atlantic, but also in the Pacific on, on the past submarine volcanic plateaus, and then uh, outcrops on lands, especially specifically here in the Apennine area of, the, of Italy. Uh, and here you can also see it's normally a lot of limestone as well, and here you can really nicely see this flat shale layer. Um, so, global occurrence um, was. Uh, specifically, high abundance of or frequency of, of black shale occurrences in the Atlantic and sometimes in the Pacific. What we see is also the time of, of enhanced um, rates of marine as well as terrestrial organic matter accumulation in these areas. Here are estimates, so you can see here the distribution of 
organic carbon content of the black shale. So we see the huge variability, but uh, really a, a tendency to, to enrich organic carbon contents. But sometimes that's difficult. So just identifying Cretaceous black shales on the basis of organic carbon contents is a little bit tricky because uh, it can be diluted. So you can still record an OAE event without having a black shale because uh, the organic carbon uh, deposition can be diluted by high sedimentation rate or uh, the organic carbon maybe was just consumed um, in the period uh, that, that passed. Um, there are other indicators except for these high organic carbon contents. So uh, here, this is data from Demira rice. So I will talk a little bit about Demira rice later. It's ODP like 207. Um, atrial Cretaceous black shales. In this area, so here you see the sediment depth. Yeah, 450 uh, meter sediment depth. There's this Cretaceous organic enriched layers with organic carbon content of up to 30 percent. And what you also see, like here's a high resolution in this layer, is like this positive excursion. So a much lighter uh, um, delta C13 values in the organic matter, and that's. Uh, very typical, so typical marine is uh, 25, minus 25. What you see here is, is like a, a major, an indication for a major burial of organic carbon, thereby making the remaining pool much more heavier in the, in the water cover. So what happens during this anoxic events? Um, we have a pretty good understanding nowadays of what we think how these events unfolded um, and how they um, finished and ended. So this is a Cretaceous um, anoxic event in the nutshell. Um, so what we think was the trigger is, is probably an increased volcanic activity, mantle activity that leads to, uh, led to an increased volcanic activity, enriching the atmosphere and CO2 and creating a quite extreme greenhouse gas, uh, a greenhouse climate with Greenhouse gas um, or CO2 um, concentrations in the atmosphere about three to five. Some people think about eight times up to eight times higher than at present day. Um, so in this greenhouse environment, you have enhanced weathering rates, you have an enhanced hydrological cycle, uh, bringing nutrients out into the ocean. Uh, this sparks like a, a increased primary productivity in the ocean. You have more material that sinks in the ocean and gets degraded by bacteria in the ocean. These bacteria use oxygen in the ocean to degrade this organic material and thereby deplete uh, the oxygen in the ocean. So we are in a much warmer climate. So oxygen uptake is already reduced because uh, the warmer waters contain uh, less oxygen than the colder waters. Um, and there's an enhanced consumption, so turning the ocean anoxic. And then in this anoxic environment is this increased productivity. You have a higher deposition of organic material. You're forming these big shales. You're burying this organic carbon, thereby terminating this event, cooling down the climate, and the Earth system returns uh, to a much more comfortable state. So that's what we think happened. Uh, this comes with uh, a lot of geochemical changes. Um, so here you can see the same, like this increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, have an increased nutrient inputs. Um, some people are doing some OEs, definitely there's evidence for gas hydrate release. So this is a further climate amplifier. So you have a warm climate, you destabilize the gas hydrates in marine sediments, they release methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas, further amplifying this greenhouse climate. Um, you have this, this upwelling, this produced, uh, this increased productivity, the deposition of the black shales was a characteristic uh, carbon excursion, um, you have the, the fixing of iron and manganese minerals in the sediment, the deposition of these really laminated black shales in this anoxic waters, um, increased denitrification, which emits further greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, which is into O, um, carbonated solution. So, in all of these geochemical changes, you can see in this OAE sequences. One big question that's remained is like, 
There's evidence for this enhanced carbon burial, and there are always two schools of thought. Um, what is the main driver of this carbon burial? Is it the high productivity or is it high preservation? So there are these two ways. This is a modern day ocean. We produce um, all hydroplankton and organisms fixed carbon in the surface ocean. Um, once they die, they sink through the ocean. They get degraded. This organic material gets degraded on its way down by microbes. Some of it reaches the sediments. Gets buried in the sediment, gets further degraded by microbes, and ultimately only a tiny, tiny fraction of what gets exported from the surface ocean gets ultimately buried in the ocean, uh, in the deep sediment. But that fraction is very important because it controls a lot of things, among which, for instance, the concentration of oxygen in our atmosphere. Um, but what we know is during the Cretaceous anoxic events, this fraction was significantly larger. So there are two ways. So you can either um, just increase the input and thereby increasing the output as well, the burial flux, or you can increase the preservation. So decrease the microbial consumption of this organic material as it travels through the ocean sediment system and thereby increasing burial flux. Um, we know that there was a high productivity, there's likely a high preservation as well because in anoxic environments often organic material gets degraded much slower. Um, so it's probably an interplay, but we have no real handle about uh, what's the importance of these two processes and which one played which role in starting the recovery from this array. Luckily, um, there's an ocean drilling program. Um, it's a beautiful record. And here on this ODP leg, site 207, the Mirara Rise, which was drilled in the early 2000s, here just off the coast of Suriname, it's the Oceanic Plateau. Um, there are five sites that were drilled here on the northern edge of this Oceanic Plateau, um, a few kilometers, well, a few hundred meters down in the sediment. And all, at all of these sites, you find extensive. Um, Cretaceous, late Cretaceous black shales from Hawaii 2. So here you see a core photo, you see the black shale that's an overlying sediment. That's one example, that's also size 1258, uh, I showed before. So you have this extensive layer of organic rich material here around five to 400 meters down in the sediment. This um, organic matter contains up to 30 weight percent, it's, it's quite a lot more than marine sediments. Is definitely always less than, than one way to set it. And this is not um, If you look at the core water, so these are these waters that are in, in the core spaces between the brains, you can analyze their geochemical signatures. So, what we see here, so here again, we see this sequence from this one side. These are core water profiles from all the sides, and this is a little bit difficult to read. So here the depth scale is always normalized to the top of this black shale layer at every side. So there are different, slightly different depths at every side. So some sides are a little bit shallower, and some sides this one is one of the deepest spots, so it's 400 meters high. So here one, this line is always the top of the black shell. The red lines. And what we can observe at all of these sites are like very similar patterns in certain uh, geochemical species. So what we see is a linear degrees of salt rate from normal seawater values down here to the top of the black shales, very, very low values. Um, same time, we see accumulation of ammonium um, diffusing back up here to the seafloor, to normal seafloor values. Uh, we see uh, uh, kind of indications of methane production down here in this black shale layer, um, and then subsequently a decrease in concentration on the top of these black shale layers, and uh, accumulation of dissolved barium in this layer, and then again, yeah, um, a decrease of these concentrations on top of this black shale layer. So, based on these profiles uh, that we're having, there's very, very strong evidence that there is something going on still in these black shale layers. And this is, I still find that even after this time, after all of this time, which is almost 20 years, I still find this absolutely mind blowing. There is 
a hundred million year old layer of organic rich material that uh, is buried really, really deep down in the sediment. And it looks like there are still microbes that are degrading this organic material, uh, consuming sulfate, producing methane, and producing, uh, producing ammonia, and producing methane. So this is, this is quite amazing. So this, based on this, um, we know, and this is also one of the achievements of the, of the ocean drilling program, um, it's like we start to know a lot about what we call the deep biosphere. So it's, it's a biosphere that lifts down very deep in the sediment. And we know as you go deeper in the sediment, so this is a lot scale, this is a depth in the sediment. Um, so we would be around this range here. So this is a um, number of cells. So we know that there is a, a very rapid decrease in the microbial cells. So we know that this is a very extreme environment. So if you have uh, microbes that live deep down there that are using organic material that was produced 100 million years ago in an ocean that was completely different from what our modern ocean looks like. Um, and they are still degrading this material under this really, really hard conditions. So very, very far away from any oxygen. There's no oxygen that comes down or any powerful terminal electron acceptors and really just using either uh, sulfate reduction or methanogenesis, so very little energy gain for them to maintain themselves. Um, so this was our hypothesis. So it's a question. Are these Cretaceous flag shales active bioreactors in the deep biosphere? Is there active microbial degradation? So you can't incubate that. People have tried it. Um, it doesn't really, because the rates are so low that can't really see anything. So how do we find this out? What we also know is like based on previous um, studies. So this is a compilation and you don't see the data points here because that's a really nice conceptual figure. Uh, but this line obviously uh, is fitted to data points. So this is a compilation of a lot of incubation experiments um, and other methods of uh, determining the reactivity of this organic material as a function of age. And as you can see, this is really nicely fitting this uh, vertical view. So obviously we have organic material being produced here. So it's very fresh, it gets degraded very rapidly. It's, it has a high reactivity. It's, it's, it's very juicy. It's something the microbes can easily access and consume. And as it sinks down in the ocean, it gets all the, all the um, easy to degrade components are already degraded. And after a really, really long time together, so here you are a uh, thousand years, 10,000 years, you end up with something that is not that reactive. Uh, and that would be the range we are looking at. Um, but I always like to think about it as like the burger and rice cake scale. So you have like some very yummy food up there and some. Um, eatable food, but maybe it wouldn't be your first choice if you would have a whole palette of foods to choose from. So it's really the question, where are we here in these black shales? Um, do they fit this, this contact we have of the ocean? Uh, do they lie completely somewhere completely here? You see the data is up to um, a million years. Yeah, that's a million years. Uh, the greatest potatoes black shale would be like uh, another two orders of magnitude, 100 million years uh, down the line here, there, we didn't have any data from that. So how do we find this out? We can't incubate. Um, we have the pool water observations. So that's the only information we have from which we could potentially extract quantitative information. So how do we do that? And so uh, modeling. Reaction transport modeling is a great tool um, because it allows us to test hypotheses, but also to um, formulate these, these research hypotheses and extract this quantitative information. So how does it work? I have my observations, you've seen us, they were measured on board or in the lab afterwards. And then uh, I have my specific research question I'm asking and I'm building a reaction transport model. So it's, it's basically a model that simulates or that builds a virtual sediment column. So it 
it simulates like the concentration profiles I'm observing here in my form. And with this model, so I built this model. I constrain parameters, so all the reaction parameters, but also diffusion, diffraction, forcing um, conditions. Um, I know what's happening, or I have to constrain somehow what's happening at the boundaries, bottom water concentrations. And then with this information, I run the model. Um, and then typically, I compare the simulation results with the observations. And if you do that circle one time, typically that doesn't fit. Yeah. So it's uh, it's very, very rare and almost never happens that um, your simulations fit the observations. And it's, it's because there's something you're missing out here or something you're missing here. So what you do, you go back you go back either to the model or to the parameterization. You have a look again, you say, okay, what am I missing? Um, maybe there are certain parameters you don't know very well, so you're testing other possibilities and you run the model again. And eventually you, you will get a good fit and that will give you an idea um, of what's happening, of rates that are happening down there and this will give you quantitative information. Now, there could be obviously more than one possible solution to that. So you could have different assumptions. You could have different models with different parameters that fit the observations equally well. Um, but it's typically in the very narrow range, so that's your uncertainty. Um, very often, you, you just have this one range of solutions that fits your observation, especially when you have very comprehensive cold water and um, uh, solid phase uh, geochemical profiles like you get, for instance, from ODP cores. So they contain a lot of information. You have a lot of extra information um, from the biostratigraphic record, for instance. And with all of this information, if you put all of this information in the model, you typically arrive at a very narrow range um, of parameters that you the same So that's what we did. Uh, took the observations, built this virtual sediment pool with this like share layer here, and then try to fit the cohort of profile. So here is the, just the fitting results from one side. You can see the sulfate is the uh, uh, model result, the, the, the line, and the observations are the points. And what you can see is like it's, it's fitting pretty well. You, you see this uh, decrease in sulfate. Um, you even resolve some of these little bits, which have to do with porosity changes and changes in transport parameters. Uh, the methane concentration here is it's normal that the model predicts higher concentration because these observations are not uh, quantitative, they are only qualitative methane gas, uh, rapidly the gases. Uh, so it's, it's it's basically just indicating the presence of non millimeter concentration, so it could be even a little bit higher. Um, ammonium, pretty nice fit. And out of this, uh, so by fitting this, we, we get the, the parameter for the reactivity. We have a quantitative information for the reactivity of this organic material. So the, the parameter says that fits best the observations is basically here. So holds pretty well on this general trend. So what we see is like, yes, these microbes, they are hundreds of million years late for dinner. So they, they are still degrading these um, Cretaceous black shales. It's just they are not very reactive. That's also something we expect. This is 100 million year old material that has been degraded over 100 million years. Um, so likely the material that's left over, even though they still got a really good portion of So some of these organic carbon bonds were at 38%, so this is quite significant, uh, it's, it's very unreactive. But it still doesn't tell me anything. So this is a now situation. So this is just saying, this is what's happening right now in the deep ocean, in the deep sediment. Uh, but it's not telling me what happened back in the Cretaceous at the OAE ocean, in the OAE ocean. Were these Cretaceous black shales rather here in the normal like, uh, burger space or were they already rice cakes? So other words, it's like, was it the productivity that was driving this, which would indicate it's the normal world, or were they already quite unreactive 
And this is why we see such high organic carbon concentrations. So it's not answering this question. We, we don't have any information about this. So how can we answer this question? So while doing this work, what we've seen, so I take you back to the four water profiles, where we've seen on the four water profiles, there's also an accumulation of the barrier down in the flex shale layer. Um, and that kind of disappears on the top of the flex shale. Now, that is something that's not really difficult to figure out what's happening here, because that's happening in a lot of other sediments as well. Um, what we see here is, is basically, it's, it's like there is biogenic barite that is um, always enriched in organic matter rich layers. It's used as a paleoproxy for paleoproductivity. So if you have a lot of organic matter, it's very likely that you have a lot of biogenic barite in those. And this barrier is, is actually thermodynamically not super stable. As soon as the sulfate is um, depleted in the pool waters, it starts dissolving. And that's what we see here. There's no um, sulfate down in the flex shales. Um, so the barrier is dissolving, it's diffusing up full. And as it meets that sulfate front, so the sulfate that's diffusing from uh, the seafloor down, it re precipitates as autogenic barriers. So as soon as the pool waters become oversaturated again, with respect to barite, there is reprecipitation of barite. And these autogenic fronts is something that we see very often, and that we see very often associated to the anaerobic oxidation of the impact. So what we see in all these course, so these are the previous um, uh, results from uh, four sites. It's like you have like shale layers. So you have sulfate diffusing down from the seafloor. Um, and being consumed by the methane that's produced in the black shales that's fusing upwards, and they are microbes that then oxidize that methane with the help of sulfate to CO2. And that's always here at the top of the black shale layer. So that was our hypothesis. So you have like the sulfate diffusion in the black shales that's dissolving the biogenic barite. Uh, the barrel dissolves upwards and precipitates probably in this AOM zone. Yeah. So the idea was like, well, if we would have a very detailed record of barrel just on top of these black shale layers, um, maybe we could reconstruct the movement of this sulfate methane transition fronts. And through that, we could reconstruct the methane production in this black shale. And maybe with this information, that would give us some information of how reactive that material was over the past hundred years. Back at that time, it didn't have that. So what we did, it's like, uh, yes, is the same. Um, also, what we've seen in this is like that um, the sulfide methane transition point is actually quite sensitive to the methane flux that's coming down from the flex shale. So if you just double the new flux, you shift that from by 50 meters in the sediment reference. So it's a really, really good indicator of how much methane is coming from the flex shales. And therefore, it could be a really good indicator of this SMTZ migration over the past 100 million years. So that's what we try. It's, it's a little bit of a crazy idea. When, you know, when you're young, you think like uh, you know it all and you can do it. And uh, interestingly, so we went back to the pool and uh, a colleague of mine sampled this layer just on top of the uh, black shades in high resolution. And we found this barite profile. Um, and then somebody did uh, super isotope analysis on this. And you can really see that these are also uh, autogenic precipitates. So this is an autogenic barite record. It's, it's not a paleo barite record. It's a, it's a secondary signal. It's not a primary signal. Um, so the idea was like, okay, if we manage to like reconstruct um, or run a model over 100 million years with the conditions of deposition at this site and manage to reconstruct this record, um, then we have learned something about the methane flux out of the black shales and its reactivity of the organic material. So that's what we did. We need to reconstruct that and learn something about the Cretaceous environment. So we take the model we built, and then it's kind of 
where you're probably all a little bit too young. This is a tape. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's like when you listen to a tape, so you, say you turn it around or you have to like rewind it. Um, so this is kind of like rewinding the sedimentary record. So this is today, but we want to go back at the time where this was just deposited. So we spin back the model and then run it forward and let it produce barite. Um, and we do that many, 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 many times with different assumptions about the reactivity of this organic matter in the black shales. And all the information about sedimentation rates we have, uh, sulfate con concentration in bottom waters over the past 100 million years, which is obviously very, very coarse information. It's, it's not that we have a yearly record of sedimentation rates. So we have linear sedimentation rates for longer geological uh, times. And we try to find uh, the solutions that come close to this record. And that tells us something about how reactive this material was. Um, and so that's what I did um, over a lot of inter iterations. And interestingly, the sources of that I didn't expect, um, there was only like a very narrow range of solutions. Yes, something that looks like this. Um, so here are the results. So you see three different lines there for three different sulfate uh, concentrations in the ocean because sulfate concentration has changed from the Cretaceous to the present and there are uncertainties in that in the reconstruction. So they kind of give the envelope of these uncertainties. Um, it's, it's a pretty important factor. And then we have linear sedimentation rates for different periods that were determined from the H model for these cores. Um, and what you can see is like roughly similar periods. So this is obviously also a very stark simplification because obviously the sedimentation rate is not uh, three meters per million years for the first almost 20 million years. It probably varied quite a bit, but this is just to get the general picture. Um, and we have some important hiatuses uh, that play an important role for the outgenic mineral precipitation because they allow these fronts to form. Um, so if we uh, if you get these right, you already got a, a good handle of the record. Um, so what you can see is like you have the Cretaceous black shale. This just after the deposition of that Cretaceous material, and it gets buried down over the next few tens of million years. Buried down. Um, you have like the barite dissolving, and here's the bi biogenic barite. You have algogenic one forming here. Then you have further sedimentation that smears out. So because the sediment is, is buried and the sulfate methane transition zone is moving upwards continuously, you have like this record that moves up. Then you have a hiatus. You have a big one that's forming here. And then moving down again, the bad present one that's forming here. And you can see, you, you can really reproduce these two peaks. So it's a paleo peak. Then the front that forms through this, the hiatus while this early front is dissolving and then reprecipitating another autogenic barrier front at close to present day conditions. And when you do that, there's only a narrow range of organic matter reactivities that gives you this distribution. And um, this is the uh, um, reconstructions of organic matter reactivities in these Cretaceous back shape. So what you can see is like they were already quite unreactive, even at the time of deposition. So typically you would expect at the time of deposition, something in this range, so normal reactivity of marine organic material. But there were already orders of magnitude less reactive um, than this early material, and then also less reactive throughout time. And that indicates that there was a higher preservation of this organic material um, in these black shares and what you would normally observe in a normal environment. And that fits really well, but because what we know is like during these times in the Cretaceous, uh, the equatorial Atlantic, so this was a time when the Atlantic was in the process of opening, and the equatorial Atlantic was very anoxic and very eugenic, so there was a free sulfide in the water column. And as you can see here in this compilation, uh, like on Canfield, um, in oxenic environments, uh, you have a higher preservation. 
Uh, so the, the organic material is preferentially preserved, not degraded. That fits really well to this uh, potato spring shape. And we, we determine preservation efficiencies of around 80%, which also makes sense because if you nowadays find 38% um, in an organic rich deposit, it's, it's, uh, it's very unlikely that you have a minimal degradation because that would mean you would have a, yeah, but in the worst case, above 100%, which is unrealistic um, concentration of organic carbon. So, what causes this low organic matter reactivities? Now, obviously, the model can't give us the answer, it only can give us the number, right? So, it tells us it's very likely this organic material has been unreactive since time of deposition, comparably to normal marine organic matter, but why it doesn't tell us. So we go back to the data. So, and again, luckily this is an ODP site, so there's a lot of data coming out and there are a lot of people working on different aspects. So we have the organic geochemists who find biomarkers for green sulfur bacteria. So these are bacteria that live in the photic zone, which indicates that there were photic zone euxenia, so a very, very oxidic environment. So that fits well. What we also find is that there is a link between organic carbon contents or in, in sulfur in this organic material. So and what happens is like in these uh, sulfide-rich environments, the organic material can react with this sulfur. Um, and can form very stable bonds that are very, very difficult to break. Um, and so our hypothesis is that like in this UCA environment, um, this organic carbon has been made less reactive by the sulfurization of the organic matter in uh, this Cretaceous motion. So sulfurization, so this is um, how we think it works. Uh, so you have the increased the primary productivity, you make the ocean anoxic, uh, you make it very sulfidic, so you have mixenia up here until into the photic zone, a lot of really sulfide in the water column, and then you have the sulfurization. Um, back at that time, um, what we knew about sulfurization of organic matter was that it's a rather slow process that happens in the sediment in really long time scales via condensation reactions, so on timescales of a few thousand years, so slow process, which is helping the preservation of the organic material that's buried there, but wouldn't necessarily have a direct uh, rapid climate effect. But then, um, a few years later, a few decades later, um, in Carriaco Basin, um, there was some work published about fast water color sulfurization. So there, a lot of the organic material that sinks in this anoxic eucinic basin is sulfurized very, very rapidly in the water color before it reaches the sediment. And that organic material that is sulfurized in the water color makes up a big portion of the um, organic material that's buried in the sediment. So if that's happened in the water column, this will likely have um, an impact on the carbon cycle and on the redox conditions of the transportation ocean. So our question was like, well, if organic matter sulfurization is really rapid and efficient, maybe that's an efficient ecosystem recovery mechanism. Maybe that's kind of kicking off the recovery from the OAE conditions of the Earth system. So how do we test that? Now there we have to go away from our sediment model and we now have to go to an earth system model. So there are different earth system models. There are like different complexities. You have the, the typical conceptual box models, uh, like Werner model, for instance. And then you have very comprehensive models that are like, for instance, models that predict our current weather. Um, now, this is interesting, but it doesn't provide us with spatial resolution to, to investigate spatial patterns. So you could use a box model, but it's still lacking a little bit of information, of course, especially for the Cretaceous. We do have a lot of information. We have the paleogeography. We um, have uh, all the reconstructions. We have good information about whether like shales were found and things like that. So this is often used for deeper time scales. This is something we can use in the Panerozoic. These models are too computational and expensive to run uh, for paleo climate. So what we use is a CGE earth system model. So it's 
um, resolves over biogeochemical cycles, it's very simple the atmosphere, it has a uh, circulation scheme that, that uh, catches uh, the priest order, uh, general circulation uh, features, and also has a land model which we didn't use for these kind of simulations, simply like ice sheet. Um, and we de developed an official sediment model that we can couple to this model on a global scale um, to do these simulations. So, and with these couple of models, we then look into the Cretaceous. And here you have a like, simulation. So, this is pre Cretaceous conditions, this is peak OE conditions. And here you see the organic carbon distribution over the Cretaceous world in the sediment surface sediment. Um, and this is overlined by the occurrence of black shales. So circles are, we know that they are black shales, triangles are black shales, maybe or maybe not, and uh, crosses is no black shales found. Uh, and we get this distribution um, actually quite right uh, with the model. So this pre and this peak distribution is especially in the Atlantic. Um, and then we lacked this organic material salt rise. So here you have sulfurization rates. So this is a, a, a rather low rate. And then if you have higher rates, you see uh, here is the difference in organic carbon content of the surface sediment to the um, normal run. And you can see like quite the higher the sulfurization, the higher the enrichment in organic carbon. Um, so which means that uh, you have, especially in this eucenic areas, uh, a very efficient organic carbon burial. And this fits really well uh, with the observation. So obviously this is over predicted. So this is a very rapid one where you would um, burn a massive amount of carbon. But if you look at this medium range here, the, the rays uh, that were also observed in the area of you, you get a, a, a reasonable transition. And so it, it is possible to reconstruct this and um, see that more organic carbon gets buried, but it also has an impact on the radix state of the ocean. So here we see oxygen profiles, um, H2S, and vertical um, sulfurization rates. So this is uh, just a transect through the global ocean. And here you have the global map. So this is just a global ocean and then distributed depths, so it's one deep cut, or two deep cuts in the global ocean. Yeah, latitude and depth, when we are looking into the ocean. And what we see, so this is uh, pre-conditions, no sulfurization. And then we have here um, OAE to peak conditions with sulfurization. And what we see, if there's no sulfurization, we have pretty eucenic ocean, uh, pretty anoxic ocean, with large eucenia, um, with the sulfurization. And then if we have a uh, sulfurization, if we switch that on, we can see how the eucenia slowly uh, disappears, uh, the anoxia slowly is reduced, the eucenia disappears, and you have this sulfurization. So what we see is that sulfurization is not only very efficient in burying organic material, it also helps, helps the immune system in recovering from these extreme redox perturbations, so from these anoxia and leukemia. And that would get their system back to a normal mode of operation. So you, you bury this excess CO2 in the sedimentary record, um, the ocean recovers from these anoxia and, and starts to regrade the organ that's a normal. So this can really work as the first kickoff of this recovery mechanism. I think the Earth system is complex enough. Um, there's not only one mechanism that drives something. Uh, you see that here, you obviously need high primary productivity. You need this combination of preservation uh, to get the patterns right. Uh, it's the same as the recovery. There are probably multiple processes at scale. There are also like rid of protection mechanisms. There is a, a phosphate, a phosphorus cycling that works in these anoxic sediments that can have certain feedback processes. So it's, it's a lot of processes operating at scale, but organic matter sulfurization can play a role in helping in this recovery. So what did we learn from these autogenic barriers that really make our life normally so difficult because they really spoil our paleo productivity proxy record? 
So we've seen that even after 100 million years, Cretaceous black shales are still substrate for heterotrophic activity in the deep biosphere. And again, we still find this absolutely amazing. Um, the organic matter is not very reactive, which is to be expected. And, and this is important, most probably never really was. So always less reactive than what we are depositing nowadays in the uh, modern day ocean. A likely explanation for this low reactivity is that this organic material, especially in the equatorial Atlantic, was deposited in the sulfidic ocean, leading to the sulfurization of this organic material. Um, and then we see that a past sulfurization in the water column is possible and can significantly increase the organic carbon burial, decrease ocean anoxia and leucemia. And it's possible that the Earth system used sulfurization as a kickoff mechanism to oxygenate the ocean and cool down the Cretaceous uh, hotels. So, and then with that, I want to thank some people who have helped with this, first of all, Hans Buzak, uh, who has been in the ODP lab and uh, provided these uh, sediment cores, and who was also uh, very supportive in um, going back to the coast and taking the the high resolution barite record so following these crazy ideas. And uh, my former PhD student, Dominic Curza, who's done a lot of the Earth system model simulations together with uh, Andrew Richard.